Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Jack Hemingway. Tonight we're going to begin our show with an activity most of us took part in when we were young kids, much to the disgust of our mothers. If you grew up near a pond, chances are you spent a fair amount of your summer vacations catching frogs and toads and maybe small snakes, or maybe even scooped up a few tadpoles, put them in a tank to see them transform from fish into frogs. Well, if you're still chasing amphibians and frogs when you grow up, you're referred to as a herpetologist. Going hunting for frogs and snakes is called herping. Boy, he's pretty excited. Yeah. This fellow is a Great Basin Spadefoot toad. He is specially adapted to live in arid sagebrush regions like those of southern Idaho. In the springtime, spadefoots take advantage of temporary waters such as ponds and irrigation ditches to breed. When the mating season is over, they leave the ponds behind and burrow into the earth to escape the heat. They may stay underground for possibly years at a time under bad conditions. Oh, really? They're really adapted to deserts and droughts. The spadefoot derives its name from the black spade-like protrusions on its hind feet. They are used for digging. When they dig, they dig backwards into the ground like that. I don't know, maybe we, can, maybe we could get him to dig here, I don't know. Herpetologist Chuck Peterson is a biology professor at Idaho State University. He's never lost his childhood fascination for amphibians and reptiles, growing up to become the quintessential scientist with a winsome curiosity for all things that hop, croak, and crawl. You know, I don't know why a particular animal speaks to a particular person, but I think most people feel that way towards some type of organism, either a plant or an animal. And I've always felt this way about amphibians and reptiles since I was a little kid. That's typical, too, of herpetologists, scientists that study amphibians and reptiles as they start out as, you know, child herpetologists, that, and they just sort of never grow up. Well, you sure see they sure blend in with the sand there, don't they? In no time at all, nothing remains but the toad's eyes. He blinks and disappears completely, burrowing into the protection of the cool, damp earth. Well, they're, they're fairly, you know, cryptic animals. They have a low visibility. They're hard to see. They, you know, are what we call ectothermic. They get their heat from the environment, and they have about one-tenth of the energy requirements that a mammal or a bird has. Gosh, where is he? There he is. You got it? Mm -hmm. Although amphibians and reptiles tend to be grouped together, there are some very distinct differences. An amphibian has a thin, moist skin, but a reptile skin is dry, thick, and scaly. Reptiles, snakes, turtles, and lizards begin life as a miniature version of their parents, either born live or hatching from eggs. Amphibians borrow their name from the Greek amphibios, meaning living a double life. They start out as an aquatic larvae, or tadpole, and eventually develop into a semi-terrestrial animal like a frog, salamander, or toad. This noisy fellow is a western toad, a distant cousin of the spadefoot. He, he has uh, a much rougher skin and much more prominent uh, bumps and uh, like warts on there. Those are actually concentrations of poison glands. That's how they protect themselves. This species was once found throughout the West, but in the last few decades, Western toad populations have been declining. According to a recent study, in the state of Colorado, the Western toad has disappeared from 80% of its historical range, an alarming trend among many amphibian species that seems to be occurring worldwide and the reasons for those declines are not well understood and we're concerned about that for the animals themselves uh, because they're important components of the ecosystem and also because they may be telling us something about what's going on in the environment. Some of the decline can be attributed directly to pollution and habitat loss. Human-caused problems that have escalated dramatically in recent decades. In the next 30 years, up to one half of our Earth's species could face extinction due to worldwide deforestation, development, and destruction of our wetlands. In the United States alone, we are draining our wetlands at the rate of an acre a minute. But what is especially alarming is the fact that many of the drastic declines in some amphibian populations are occurring in relatively pristine areas such as Yosemite and Grand Teton National Parks. 
In these protected areas, habitat loss is not a factor. So why are amphibians disappearing? This is a question haunting herpetologists everywhere. Here at Idaho's Bruno Dunes State Park, researcher Chuck Peterson is looking for some answers. A cooperative study spearheaded by Idaho State University has been launched to determine how our state's amphibians are faring. Population trends will be monitored on a weekly basis by fish and game biologist Mike McDonald. And an interesting new technology will be part of the effort. Okay, this is a, like basically a, what's called a data logger. We're interested in determining what species are present at particular locations and under what conditions they're active and calling. So that's like a small field computer that will turn on the tape recorder uh, every few minutes and then measure the weather conditions and then turn the tape recorder off. And we'll find it. Along with the sound of the toad's mating call, the computer also records water and air temperatures and wind speed at the time of the call, all of which may affect mating activity. It also registers shortwave radiation. Some scientists speculate that due to a decrease in the ozone layer, ultraviolet radiation may be a leading cause of some of the amphibian decline in higher elevations. Because of a number of their characteristics, like they uh, develop in the water and then undergo metamorphosis and then come out onto land and they're thin, you know, moist, permeable skins, they're very susceptible to, say, chemicals in the environment, changes in radiation, and so forth. So they may be very sensitive indicators of environmental change. And for that reason, what's happening to them may be an indicator of what may be happening, you know, down the line for other organisms, including us. Okay, now we got to put this in the water somewhere. Just as the last wire is put into place, a rainstorm blows through the area, leaving behind windy, unsettled weather. The blustery day gradually yields to an eerie dusk, and with the darkness come the night sounds. I would sure be excited if we could see them actually calling. That would be the best. Springtime is the best time of the year to go herping. The male toads are out in force, trying to attract females with their gruff mating calls. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a wood house. He's getting ready for his nightly activity. <laughs> uh, they come back and they sit on the edge of the water like that, and they rehydrate. There's a ventral part of the skin there that's specially uh, adapted for picking up the moisture, and they, it's right on their belly. Mike tries to get the toad to respond to a tape recording of mating calls. The toad's not buying it. I would sure be excited if we could see them actually calling. That would be the best. Only the males have these large vocal sacs under their chins. This series of still photos shows the toad's calling posture. He braces himself firmly with his front legs and then lets go with his call. The dark patch at his throat expands dramatically with each croak. These are called nuptial pads. When they're mating, uh, the toes here, this gets enlarged and it gets roughened, and that helps him uh, grab the female and implexus. Herpetologists are just beginning to unravel the complex world of these creatures. The apparent decline of some amphibian population points to the critical need for intensive, long-term study but it's often simple natural curiosity that builds the foundation for great scientific discoveries. So the rest of the evening is spent combining biology with the pure childlike pleasures of pursuing things that hop, croak, and crawl. I want to get a good picture of that too. They've been called gnomes of the night. They're part of a world we often overlook but cannot afford to lose. For not only will that indicate that we've ravaged the earth for future generations, it may mean that our own kids and grandkids will never experience the delightful pleasure of chasing a frog on a summer evening. Here's another wood house. I, I think these guys have a lot of character. <laughs> Springtime. As the days soften into summer, it's not only frogs and toads that have love on the brain. For most of Idaho's bird species, spring is the nesting season. But in order to reproduce, you have to find a mate. In some species, like the sharp-tailed grouse, the male goes to great, great lengths 
to prove to the female of the species that he's the right bird for the job. Before the sun has even kissed the mountaintop, a whisper of sound gives them away. In the soft blue light before sunrise, an anxious male scurries to position himself in the choice spot of the dancing ground. The dawn breaks and the blue light turns to amber, stretching out to bathe the valley in rich golden tones. The lone male is joined by other early risers, bent on challenging his position. They scramble to and fro across the dancing ground in a seemingly aimless fashion. But actually, it's a strictly choreographed dance passed down through the centuries, a contest that dictates the hierarchy of the flock, determining which of the males will win the privilege of breeding with a female and earn the right to pass on their genetic code to the next generation. The dancing ground is called a lek, it's an area chosen by the grouse for its visibility, so the males can see and respond to each other. The mesh structures crisscrossing the lake are traps. These were put into place several days ago by fish and game biologists to capture some of the birds. The first morning was a success, but since then the birds have become wary. Unless a female appears on the lake, causing the males to become careless in their frenzy to please her, the chance of a capture is pretty slim. Research biologist Scott Gardner watches the activity from a tent perched on the edge of the dancing ground. As long as he stays inside, the birds are willing to ignore him. They try to get these prime territories, and once they get them, as you can see, that one male hardly moved from that one spot. Once they get them, they defend them really well. The pageantry is as old as time. The ruling bird is challenged by a usurper. He responds in kind, they dance and bicker, then settle in to face off, never relaxing their guard. Suddenly, in exasperation, the ruling bird turns away and once again begins to drum the earth, establishing this choice spot as his. The challenger eventually finds the stakes are too high and concedes, exiting gracefully. Juvenile males are destined to watch from the fringes. One fellow seems to surprise himself by testing a call. When he receives no reaction, he pauses, then stages a dignified retreat. You don't see a lot of those juvenile males. You'll hear them off, way off in the distance. Slowly they learn about the lek over the, over the lekking season and move on and get a little tighter and a little tighter. Although Idaho's sharp tail numbers are the highest they've been since biologists began keeping records in the 1960s, we know from historical documents that the Colombian sharp tail was much more prevalent in the time of Lewis and Clark. Though no records were kept, Scientists speculate that the drop in sharp tail populations in the last century was directly related to the settlement of the West. Early rangeland abuses damaged nesting areas and destroyed critical winter habitat. Soon, the sharp tailed grouse had disappeared from much of its historical range. But things began to turn around for the sharp tailed grouse in the mid 1980s with the initiation of the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. It's a federal plan that subsidizes landowners who are willing to seed and set aside a field for a 10-year period. These areas have become critical habitat for sharp-tailed grouse and other species. Thanks to the private landowner, the bird population has rebounded. The trapping operation is an effort to capture a portion of the sharp-tails from these healthy populations and move them back into parts of their historic range. Although this morning was a bust, back at what is affectionately known as grouse house, biologists have a number of sharp tails from previous captures ready to be released into new areas. There's a volunteer right there. The birds are held in captivity less than a week. Before releasing a group, the scientists want to be certain there's a good mix of males and females. Each grouse is weighed, banded with a leg band, and then a percentage of the birds are fitted with a solar-powered radio collar. And it's a very small, light, compact package that simply fits around over the bird's head and around its neck. Uh, we've been using these packages for about five years uh, with uh, virtually no trouble so far as we can tell and no adverse impacts on the birds themselves. The radios will tell researchers if the transplanted birds survive, whether the females nest this year and bring off a healthy brood, and finally, how the sharptails use their new habitat. Early the next morning, the birds arrive at Shoshone Basin in south central Idaho, an area the species once inhabited at, and one that biologists have determined could support a population again. It's important that the birds stay together as a flock, so the actual release is done by a primitive sort of remote control. OK. 
Okay, what I'm going to do is, is pull the rope taut so that it, and, and open the box up just gradually, giving the birds a little light at a time so that it's not a, a drastic opening of the box. And let them move out at their own pace. The birds comply, peeking out curiously. Soon, they leisurely move up the hillside, right at home in their historic habitat. In the sense, it is exciting to bring a bird that was native back to an area that, that they once existed in and, and no longer exist, to bring them back as to a part of the community to fulfill and complete that community in that situation. So. In the course of seeking out stories for Incredible Idaho, We've hauled camera gear into the backcountry by every means imaginable. By airplane, helicopter, sled, jet boat, uh, dog teams even, you name it. There's never been a lack of imagination when it comes to finding ways to ease the burden. But we may have come across the very best idea yet. And there's quite a bit of excitement among the incredible Idaho crew about an entirely new method of getting our cameras into the wild country. We may even acquire our own beast of burden. That's a boy. Come on, Yoder. That's a boy. Come on, Ralph. That's it. Good job, guys. That's a boy. Visions of Heidi and the Swiss Alps conflict with the austere beauty of Idaho's Hawaii desert country. But backcountry traveler Steve Silva has managed to blend the two in perfect harmony with his three French Alpine pack goats. What we've got, we've got uh, wooden pack saddles just like, a, just like a horse, but a scaled down version. And they have a cinch strap, a breast strap, and a rump strap. So use a saddle pad and, and a pretty normal arrangement, and then just hang panniers on the, uh, on the goats. Whoa. If you've ever been around someone loading up a mule train, you may remember it as a long, drawn-out process with the potential to become a bit of a rodeo. Not so with Steve's goats. Don't be sucking in air on Although me. they're just kids, only a little over a year old, the goats are bred to be pack animals and take to it like the proverbial fish to water. They're only about halfway grown. They weigh about 100 and 125 pounds, maybe. Now? Yeah. Really? And uh, they'll get to they'll get to be about 210 to 250 pounds. I'm sorry, yeah. Come on, goats! At this point, they can carry about 30 pounds each. Ten of our camera batteries and about five videotapes. But by the time they're full grown, they can haul up to 60 pounds. Now we're talking our camera and the 22-pound tripod. Come on, boys. The goats follow Steve like small puppies. When they're first born, the kids are taken from the female and hand-fed by their new owner. They become what biologists term imprinted on a human. Wherever Steve leads, they will cheerfully follow. Steve first began looking into pack animals when he and his wife, Jan, had their first daughter, three-year-old Kelsey. They both love the outdoors and didn't want a young family to curtail their treks into Idaho's backcountry. He decided horses and mules required too much maintenance, and llamas proved too expensive. Then Steve heard about John Monzinski, a botanist in Wyoming, who pioneered goat packing by using them to carry research gear into the mountains. Now the botanist has become a businessman, breeding and raising the animals, and running an outfitting service with a string of pack goats. Steve took a trip to Wyoming to check it out and returned a convert with Yoder, Mike, and Ralph in tow. And uh, so now, um, now the way it's growing so much, John really wanted me to help him educate people. And I want, I want my own string for hunting and fishing. That's, that's what we like to do, is go fishing up in the Alpine country. And uh, you can't get a horse into the lakes we go fishing to. That's pretty much impossible because of the talus. And uh, llamas might work, but once again, I just couldn't do it. And these goats are like, they just cruised. They went everywhere we wanted to go. When Steve says everywhere, he means everywhere. Come on, guys, let's show those llamas where you can go. The goats have little impact on the environment, treading lightly and nibbling on the brush, rather than eating a plant down to its roots. The only concern among goat packers is that folks go to a reputable breeder for their animal so they aren't shortchanged in quality. Perhaps discovering down the line that they bought a dairy goat instead of a pack goat. Come on, goat, follow us! 
And here in Idaho, I mean, we have got it. This is perfect goat country. We have like, this is unlimited. We can go anywhere we want, and here's an animal that's logical and practical and economical, and the variety of where they can go, we just got it made. Come on, goats. Come on, goats. That's right. It's about time to go. Tonight, as we close our show, we'll take you back to the Owyhee Desert, where time is the artist, using the wind to carve a magical wonderland in the rocks. For more information on goat packing, look for the book The Pack Goat by John Monzinski at your local bookstore.